Good night. Uh, thank you for connecting with us to our new webinar related with nutrition and immunity. I'm Alicia Santa Maria Orleans, responsible of scientific communication in Ordesa Laboratories and the chairperson of today's webinar that has as a title, Can Diet Improve Immune Status in Children? For presenting this subject, we come on the support of two international experts, Dr. Ascension Marcos, that is research professor at the Institute of Food Science, Technology and Nutrition of the Spanish National Research Council. Uh, she is also president of the Spanish Federation of Societies of Nutrition, Food and Dietetics, FESNAT, and president of the International Society for Immunonutrition. And we have also as a speaker at uh, Dr. Jose Manuel Moreno Villares, that is Chief of the Pediatric Department of Navarra University Clinic. We hope you enjoy this webinar and we want to remind you that uh, can send us uh, comments, questions through the section called questions in this program. And let's begin our webinar with Dr. Marcos lectures. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, thank you, Alicia, for your kind introduction. And uh, I would like also to thank Ordesa for this uh, opportunity. So we're going to start. Okay, so to what extent uh, the diet can improve the immune status in children? Well, according to the World Health Organization, enabling young children to achieve their full developmental potential is a human right and an essential requisite for sustainable development. Also, given the critical importance of enabling children to make the best start in life, the health sector, among other sectors, has an important role and responsibility to support nurturing care for early childhood development. Unfortunately, we still see cases of malnutrition around the world with a, a high deficit of micronutrients, especially uh, in zinc, iron, vitamins A and D, also damaging the immune system, so these people are going to be prone to get infections. Also, they have an abnormal microbiota mod uh, maduration and composition, and uh, leading to higher morbidity and mortality. Hidden hunger is a lack of uh, vitamins and minerals and the main trigger of malnutrition nowadays of course, uh, when the quality of food that people eat does not meet the nutrient requirements, so they are not getting the essential vitamins and minerals they need for their growth and development. And that affects 2 billion people across the globe. So as early as uh, 1845, Simon defined the thymus as a barometer of malnutrition. And it was in the 60s when Nevin Scrimshaw began working on the nutrition infection interactions. And likely he passed away in uh, 2013 at the age of 96. So we can see here the rate of uh, under five mortality per thousand life births that it decreased between 1990 and uh, 2018. In addition, who estimates that malnutrition accounts for 54% of child mortality worldwide, that is uh, around uh, 1 million children. Regarding infections, these are the mortality causes in children after five, under five in developing countries. Childhood uh, underweight is a cause for about 35% of all deaths of uh, children under the age of five years worldwide. 
Indeed, there is a very close interaction between the nutritional status and uh, the immune system. So, according to uh, Chandra in the 70s, our immune system acts as a, an umbrella protecting us against any kind of uh, pathogens or antigens. However, in the case of uh, malnutrition, this umbrella shows holes and is unable to protect us as a consequence of a process of immunodeficiency secondary to the malnutrition status. So nowadays, the coronavirus infection has provoked many changes across the world, even the immunization campaigns have been postponed. Uh, to this end, the Global Vaccine Alliance, together with, with uh, WHO and UNICEF, uh, call for joint effort to safely deliver routine immunization and proceed with uh, vaccination campaigns against deadly vaccine preventable diseases. At least nowadays, 80 million children under one are at risk of diseases such as diphtheria, measles, and polio. And in this, uh, in this table, we can see the number of uh, countries with uh, postponed campaigns since the 15th of May. According to the program on nutrition by WHO, between to, uh, 2016 and 2025, the vision is uh, to promote a world free from all forms of malnutrition, where all people achieve health and well-being. This uh, program is based on how to tackle uh, malnutrition and non-communicable diseases. Especially what nutrition works best for health and who develops evidence-informed guidance based on robust uh, scientific and ethical uh, frameworks. Even uh, here also within the uh, Quinquennium 2014-2019, uh, the priorities are the mother-child uh, bi binomial and the non-communicable diseases. Here we can see why breastfeeding is so extremely important since it provides antimicrobial components also microbiota, polyunsaturated fatty acids, nucleotides, even immune cells, especially neutrophiles and macrophages, all of them involved in the innate immune system. Also uh, cytokines or hormones and bioactive peptides. All of, all of them are anti-inflammatory factors and components promoting tolerance and maturation of the immune system. So we know that uh, there can be a reduction uh, four or five times the incidence of diarrhea during the cell's first years of life. And uh, even uh, breastfeeding has been associated with uh, a reduction of uh, 20 to 35% of a uh, breast cancer risk before menopause. Anyway, there is a, a decline of the development of any immune-related pathology. So the maturation of a neonatal immune system has a, is related to several key events. So depending always on the exposure to bacteria, in this sense, we have to take into account the delivery type, vaginal or bicesarian section. And in this case, the uh, prevalence of allergic uh, rhinitis, asthma or celiac diseases in the, uh, in, in the newborns are higher. Also, 
it depends on the uh, mother's skin, the, the uh, breastfeeding, the type of uh, lactation breastfeeding or bottle feeding, and uh, all the event, events during the first month of age. Uh, that will develop the gut bacteria colonization. So we can see here that the maturation of the neonatal immune system is very uh, related to the maturation of the infant's gut. Obviously, we already know that uh, there is a very close interaction between the immune system and the nutritional status. However, we still wonder to what extent we can think that uh, there is a relationship between microbiota and the immune system and also microbiota and the nutritional status. Uh, however, we have to take into account several relevant factors when we uh, want to interpret the results related to the microbiome. For example, here, this is um, a figure uh, that is going to be published very um, in the very near future in, in nutrients and especially uh, in relation to this uh, cycle. I'm going to focus on, on this. So um, there are inter and intra-individual factors such as age, gender, genetics, basal microbiota or brain gut microbiota axis and uh, that uh, will develop different responses in individuals. So the profile of the bacteria composition in the gut is different depending on the nutritional status, also taking into account several determinants of the lifestyle, such as uh, diet, food behavior, weight fluctuations, physical activity, sedentary habits, sleep quality and quantity, alcohol intake, smoking, and for sure, stress is one of the most important factors. Here we can see a scheme of the composition of the gut microbiota at different ages. There are more bifidobacteria in breastfed babies, meanwhile, there are more bacteroidetes in bottle-fed babies with less bifidobacteria. And also in, in the child, there is a, an increase in the microbial diversity. And in the adults, we can see the normal profile with the filmicutes, bacteroidetes, and actinobacteria. Regarding the elderly, we can see the profile we found in thin people with a reduction of firmicutes and an increase of uh, bacteroidetes, together with less bifidobacteria. So probably the adipose tissue is related to this outcome. In the next feature, uh, we can see some differences in bifidobacteria due to the age. For example, at birth, the uh, bifidobacteria increase a lot, although later in life declined. Uh, probably this outcome could be related to the phenomenon of immunosenescence we found usually in the elderly. Aging is uh, associated with a decline of immune response, which can raise mortality and uh, morbidity. And uh, recently, the concept of uh, inflammation has been reported to define a global reduction in the capacity to cope with a variety of stressors and a concomitant progressive increase in pro-inflammatory status as a major characteristics of the aging process. This phenomenon is provoked by a continuous antigenic load and stress during life. Coming back uh, to the newborn, nutrition at that age will affect the immunonutrition in the future and also the microbiota. 
just uh, regarding the ability to, uh, to mount an appropriate immune response upon infection, the ability to develop a telerogenic response to self and to benign environmental antigens, and also the uh, ability to trigger mechanisms against inflammatory disorders. So the gut bacteria colonization will depend on the type of uh, delivery, as uh, I already mentioned, the type of uh, feeding the baby, uh, the food intake at early ages, the envi environment, rural or uh, urban, the coexistence with uh, animals. Also, depending on the nutritional status of the mother, the drugs intake by the mother or by the uh, newborn. And uh, finally, just to say that uh, we, we think that the dirtier the child is, the earlier his her immune system matures, together with an increase in, in, of the bacteria diversity. So especially this is uh, related to the hygiene theory. And uh, nowadays we have less infections and uh, more allergies. Regarding the environment, there are two very interesting studies, uh, Parsifal and Gabriella studies, including uh, school age children, aged between 6 and 13. And uh, the prevalence of asthma and uh, atopy uh, among children living, living on farms uh, is much lower than in uh, those children living in, uh, in uh, urban cities. Indeed, the detection of uh, environmental microorganisms in dust sample in both studies is much higher in children living on farms in comparison with the reference groups. So you can see here that uh, well, the, there is a very high uh, difference between both groups. In addition, the bacteria profiles that are related to the lifestyle factors, both in a rural, rural populations or Western populations is, a, is very, very and uh, there are very important uh, differences. And um, now we cannot uh, forget um, a very important factor, such as obesity. So now uh, we know that the prevalence of overweight and obesity among children and adolescents aged between 5 and 19 has uh, risen dramatically from just uh, around 4% in 1975 to just over 18% in 2016. And uh, also, well, the rise occurred uh, similarly among both boys uh, and girls. And according to the Imperial College London and WHO, if these figures are maintained in 2022, children and adolescents will suffer uh, more from obesity than from any moderate or severe weight deficiency. So it's an important issue we have to tackle against. If we look at the childhood overweight in the world, we can see some countries with uh, very low figures, such as in India or Pakistan, and uh, others with a very high uh, prevalence, like in Nauru in uh, Oceania, and still very high figures uh, we can see in, in Spain, uh, Saudi Arabia, Libya, also in Australia, Argentina, and much more in the States. These figures uh, scarce uh, if uh, we take into account that uh, at least sorry that at least uh, uh, almost uh, three million people die each year 
as a result of being overweight or obese and also an estimated uh, near uh, 36 million of disability adjusted life year are caused by overweight and obesity. So the total non-communicable diseases uh, mortality is around uh, 40 million from the 56 million global deaths. And also there is a premature non-communicable disease uh, mortality uh, around um, 48 percent. Also uh, the risk factors of um, premature heart disease, stroke and diabetes could be prevented and is about 80 percent. So it's something that we have to take into account very seriously. Indeed, we know that obesity is a low-grade inflammation and is the trigger of a non-communicable diseases. You can see here some of them, and also uh, they are more prone to infections and to allergies. As I, I already mentioned before, the profile of the bacteria composition in the gut is different depending on the nutritional status. And um, in the MetaHeat project, the authors found two different groups regarding the bacteria uh, diversity. So here you can see the low bacteria diversity, and the, here the group with the high bacteria diversity. So those who had a lower diversity showed an inflammatory phenotype according to the metabolic biomarkers analyzed. Also, uh, the gut-brain axis, that is a bidirectional communication system through which the brain modulates uh, gastrointestinal function and through which any alteration in gastrointestinal function, function is communicated to the brain with a perception of um, visceral events uh, such as nausea, society, or pain. So, these are some uh, of the factors uh, linked to the gut in microbiota brain axis, and therefore some strategies are starting to be studied, such as uh, the supplementation with uh, probiotics and prebiotics, and also some supplements with uh, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. So, message uh, to take uh, home. Nutrition exerts a high impact on gut microbiota and in turn the microbiota on host nutritional status and uh, health through the immune system modulation. Also, regarding the research in the near future, advances on the knowledge of the interactions with, between bioactive food compounds and specific intestinal bacteria could contribute to a better understanding of both positive and negative interactions and to the identification of new functional microorganisms inhabiting our intestinal tract. Well, just uh, to remember the next conference on immunonutrition that uh, we are organizing for July next year in Barcelona. You are invited to attend for sure. And uh, this, uh, uh, this is a picture of the last conference in Madrid with the whole international group of uh, immunonutrition. And uh, finally, this is my research group. Some of them are in different places nowadays, but uh, here you can see those who are at the lab. So thank you very much for your attention.
Hello, um, good evening from Spain, and thank you very much for attending this uh, lecture on the consequences of, on the relationship between the nutritional status and the infections. And thank you to Ordesa to uh, facilitating this uh, uh, meeting, this gathering all together from different parts of the world. The summary of my presentation will be this one. I will give some general considerations on, on the pandemia all over the, the world, but especially in Spain. And this is the reason why we decided to talk about the relationship between nutrition and immunity, because could we modify the course of a virus infection providing adequate nutrition? This is a difficult question to answer, but we could divide in three general points. Is how does the nutritional status influence the risk to suffer infections? Is there any way that um, is there any way the feeding pattern could modify the immune response? And finally, if there is any supplement or combination of supplements or nutrients that could improve the immune systems. And I would try, I will try to give some answers and um, probably more questions than answers. This is a, an updated picture of how the infection is um, uh, is behaving in, in the whole world. In the picture, you can find the number of new deaths. As you all, all of you know, the, the COVID infection started in China, then moved to uh, Europe, and finally to the United States. And in between, several other countries all over the world are suffering the consequences of the disease. And you can see in the picture, in the green line is the, sorry, in the green line is the, how the disease uh, has behaved uh, in Spain with a, a, an increase and a low, slow decrease. This is the, the one in the United States that are having the higher numbers in the whole world. This is in the, in the blue uh, line, in the, in the light blue, is the, 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 the numbers of deaths in Iran, that is like a flattening all over the time. And in, in the, in the, uh, with the red line is the numbers in Saudi Arabia. And we are not sure why the figures are so different in different parts of the world. And fortunately, in, in the Eastern Asia, the numbers are lower than in Europe. Um, this, you can see in these uh, pictures that the, the main places besides Iran are Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Egypt, but still far below the numbers of the figures we have had in Italy, Spain, or the United States, and now in Brazil. Looking back to figures from our from Spain, and this is the last. Uh, these are figures from the last uh, week. There are more than 225,000 people infected and near more than uh, 10,000 in the intensive care units. But fortunately, the number of admissions in children and young people are quite low. Only 0.6% of admissions are uh, people younger than 19 years old. And this is also the same for the ICU admissions and also for the mortality rate. At, at this present time, only eight fatalities have been reported in young people. All of them were in the group between 14 and 19 years old. Regarding how the infection affect the pregnant women as well as the neonate, there are some um, data we already know that pregnant women behave as a general population, although pregnancy is a prothrombotic uh, a scenario, there is a higher risk of thrombosis. As a general rule now in Spain, I know also in Italy, all women who go, come to the hospital for delivery, we perform a PCR in order to know the 
the immune status or the risk of of being uh, infectious prior to delivery. There is no vertical transmission to the fetus, although some series have reported a higher in incidence of premature delivery. And regarding the new the newborn, there is a risk of transmission from the mother, and also the newborn can suffer the infection. So in the case the, the mother is COVID positive, needs, needs to be isolated from the newborn, and it makes a choice a, 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 or a challenge in order to know which is the best type of feeling in this situation, because we know that COVID-19 is not in breast milk, but it, at the same time, it, it can be difficult to isolate the mom from the newborn when providing breast milk, but it is possible. So my the first question I wanted to, to address is, how does the nutritional status influence the risk to suffer infections? This is a picture that shows the number of publications uh, devoted to the relationship between malnutrition and infections. And as you can see, the Nadir took place almost near 50 years ago in the late 80s. Since then, the interest of the, of the relationship between malnutrition and infection has not been so high as in the past. Past, but as Professor Marcos has said in her presentation, we need to know that still half of the deaths in children under five are related to malnutrition. So we still have a lot to do in order to avoid this number of deaths. Uh, this is a classic picture all of us has learned in our school, our medical school that is a vicious circle. So undernutrition leads to a decreased immunity. And this is the reason to have higher number of infections that at the same time, infections cause with decreased appetite, decreased absorption, less utilization of nutrients, higher losses of nutrients, and at the end, undernutrition. If we join undernutrition and poverty, and poverty the result is mortality. So we need, as I have said before, there is still high room to improve the nutritional status in low income countries in order to avoid these deaths. But as also Professor Marco has said in her presentation, in middle, even high incomes and even low income countries, the major concern is the, um, the, the increase in the number of people with obesity with or without metabolic syndrome. And as you already know, there is a clear relationship between this condition as the immune system and impaired immunity and impaired inflammation is one of the reasons why uh, obesity is related to uh, an increased mortality and morbidity, because in once ones, they, even the, the, uh, the lymphoid tissues are all involved with, uh, with, with fat uh, cells, and this leads to a decreased immune function. In the picture, there is not a clear relationship between obesity and increased infection, but some, um, some series of cases or some reports that have studied quite, quite in detail this relationship shows that th this is also the same for infections. This is a study performed in near 40,000 healthy subjects that were blood, uh, blood donor uh, people, and they followed them over time, and they look at the numbers of some conditions. One of them was number of, the, of infections that needed to be admitted in the hospital to receive appropriate treatment. And as you can see, in both in women and in men, the risk of having, of having a, a severe infection is 1.5 higher in obese people than in normal weight population. So there is also a relationship between obesity and increased risk of infection. 
All of you uh, know, also know that it has been shown both in China as well as in, in Europe and, 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 and at the United States that, that being obese is a higher risk of severe course of the COVID uh, disease. So the number of people admitted to the ICU is higher if, if being obese. But it, this is also happens in young people. So younger people with higher BMI have a higher risk to be to need to be admitted in the ICU. So obesity and is at the same time well related to severe disease. And there are several uh, explanations for this higher or this uh, severe course. That is that obesity produces um, respiratory dysfunction, is associated with comorbidities, and you know that uh, hyperglycemia is well related to mortality in the intensive care unit, as well as other metabolic risk conditions. Why I am talking about obesity in the adult uh, and, and in a pediatric form? Because we all of us know that uh, obesity has several manifestations, even in childhood or, or in the young ages. But none of them are infection, at least in this picture. But we know that being an, an obese child is, is having a leads to a higher risk or higher possibility of being an adult with obesity or overweight. This is clearly shown in this picture that is a follow-up of 51,000 children from, from Deutschland studied from birth to adulthood and they could follow the, this cohort and show that most of normal weight adolescents had normal weight when where they were child, infant and child. And on the contrary, more, more than half of the obese adolescents also have had excess of weight when they were infants. And this is a time between less bef just before five years of age that are that are related to, to this risk. So if we can change the possibility of being obese, it's much better to do our efforts or do our tasks before five years old. And this will provide at the end a, a, a defense against being an adult with obesity. And in the case of suffering, for instance, an infectious disease as COVID-19, the possibility of having a less severe course of the infection. Uh, several years ago, we had this economical crisis in, in all over the world in, the 19, in 2008, and the results, this is uh, figures from Japan, but it, this is also happened the same, at least in Spain. We show that following the years of the economical crisis, an increase in the number of child, of children, with increased obesity, and mainly in those child children from low socioeconomic crisis. So now we are facing not only the pandemic that it, as God is going down, but probably with the economic consequences of this uh, slowdown of the economy for so long. And at the end, this, this will end probably in an increase in obesity in childhood in the next years. The second question to be addressed in, in, in my presentation is, is there any way the feeding pattern may modify the immune response? And we have heard in the previous talk that there is a close relationship between nutrients, microbiota, and maturation of the immune system. I am not going further in this topic. Uh, and mainly we know that microbiota in one of, of its effects is to enhance the defensive role, avoiding the, the interaction with pathogens in the intestinal lumen. And although this is not part of the presentation today, the relationship between nutrients and uh, microbiota, microbiota has to be with the tolerance to antigen, to or feeding antigen uh, received by, by foods. A good model uh, of this influence of uh, feeding pattern in, and immunity is, as it has been said before, breastfeeding. 
there are a lot of a lot of uh, systematic reviews and meta analysis exploring the relationship between between breastfeeding and infection. This is one of the last one published last year, and as between and this in this particular uh, meta analysis they explore the relationship between respiratory and gastrointestinal infections in this cohort of um, Danish and Denmark. Uh, 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 population. And as you can see in this slide, at the, the left side is uh, children, uh, infants who receive mixed feeding, that is bottle feeding as well as breastfeeding, and in the left with the left with the fewer B is the exclusive breastfeeding population. And as you can see, there is a decreased incidence of fever and respiratory symptoms as well as fever and gastrointestinal symptoms in both populations, but mainly in the breastfed uh, one. So, and for middle ear infections, the outcomes or the influence lasted till four years of age. Regarding the role of breastfeeding in the COVID pandemic, there is only a few things to say. There is only recommendation of what to do during the pandemia. And with these uh, particularities I have talked before regarding the possibility of, of, uh, of the risk in, in mothers with infections in the action of breastfeeding, uh, the, nevertheless, the recommendation is continue, to continue breastfeeding. But till now, there is no data on the prevention, although we know that uh, secretory IgA is present in breast milk in those mothers who suffer the infection during pregnancy. We, for how long and which is the degree of this um, prevention of this immunity is not known yet. Uh, breast milk is a, an orchestra made for a, a complete number of different uh, compounds. And we are not sure, sure which are the components that are more related to the immune system or the prevention from the infection, or probably is the combination of or the interaction of all of them. When children, when infants cannot receive breastfeeding, we provide them an infant formula and we try to give some of these advantages from breast milk, adding bioactive components to the formula although we still don't know for sure which, how much or how many of them should be present in order to get similar results to breastfeeding. Regarding beyond um, uh, infancy, is there any eating, eating pattern that provides any kind of uh, defense uh, against infection? I'm taking as a model the Mediterranean diet that we know for sure that has an influence in, in inflammation and, and in, in this sense decreasing the risk of obesity, type 2 diabetes, cancer or other inflammatory diseases, there is no way to answer the question that is uh, present in this slide. Could we say that Mediterranean diet is a cure for coronavirus? Because some news uh, opened this discussion, but as you see, the UNICEF from the WHO answered that till now there is no clear type of feeding or eating pattern that could say that make a difference regarding the severity or the course of the disease. At, at this moment, this is taken from the WHO Eastern uh, chapter that provides some general ideas on how should be the uh, eating pattern in this type of pandemia. Fresh and unprocessed foods, enough water, moderate amount of fat, less salt and sugar, and if possible, avoid to eating outside or having uh, at least enough, enough uh, care in order to avoid infections. My last uh, question was, is there any supplement or any combination of nutrients that may improve the immune system? And this is a difficult 
tango. Tango is a kind of uh, dance. It's difficult to know because it's so there are so many uh, components in the relation between nutrition and immune system to answer that questions. And uh, you know, or many of you know, that there are some nutrients that are related to uh, immune function, as zinc or vitamin C or iron or vitamin A. And we already know that there are different kinds of foods more um, rich in this component, but till now we cannot say that providing these specific foods give any difference in the uh, outcomes of the disease. You, you could say, uh, oh, Oh man, we have forgotten to talk about vitamin D that is not present in this slide. And that's right. I have not forgotten vitamin D because vitamin D has a, a different status. Uh, there are some good systematic reviews and meta analysis studying vitamin D supplementation and acute respiratory tract infections. And all this study, this is a recent study a couple of years ago in British Medical Journal, show that the uh, when comparing groups who receive vitamin D supplementation against those who do not receive, there is a decrease in the risk of the suffering and respiratory infection in those who receive the vitamin D supplementation. And the results are still better in the group who were, uh, who had low levels of vitamin D when they received the supplementation. So, makes sense to think that vitamin D and prevention for from upper or or, or, or down respiratory infection are, are there. And this paper from the WHO and regarding to uh, children, and I, I would like you to, 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 to take a look at the last sentence, is some studies have suggested that vitamin D supplementation can decrease the frequency and severity of respiratory infections among children. But till now, however, there is still a need of further research to give specific recommendations in this uh, subject. So still, till now, we only give recommendations on vitamin D regarding bone health. Uh, as, as regarding to coronavirus infections, some people has, has tried to um, relate the vitamin D status and the infections, and following only the, the, the way the diseases has, uh, has behaved, they have seen that the, the, those countries, Italy and Spain, who has low, a higher number of population with low levels of vitamin D, have, have had the, the worst um, figures in, in the whole world. So maybe that is a Maybe they, there may be a relationship between vitamin D status and probability of infection and also immortality. So this is an hypothesis that need, needs to be explored in detail, but makes makes uh, sense. This is, as you already know, and Professor Marcus worked from, from a long time in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in, in research, in nutrition, that is quite difficult to give uh, robust results regarding nutrients and prevention or treatment. So we have some data on single nutrients. We have few data on a few randomized, randomized controlled trials. There are a lot of uh, information uh, regarding the influence on nutrition. It's also the lifestyle, also the economic status in order to give clear uh, advices to the population. And my last two slides are giving some messages or ideas or sharing with you some ideas more than having some answers to, to those questions. Is Yeah, there is a clear relationship between nutritional status and immune system, both in the undernutrition side as well as in the overnutrition. That the immune system and nutrients interact within the, within the intestinal lumen and microbiota is a mediator. Microbiota should be one of our targets. targets. The better the relationship, the healthier the results. And breastfeeding is a clear model. There is no specific eating, eating pattern 
that enhance the defense against infection. So the general advice of having a healthy nutrition and a healthy lifestyle is the one we can say till now, that some vitamins and minerals can improve the immune uh, function, but unfortunately regarding the uh, COVID-19 infection, so far no nutritional strategies can be recommended and the nutritional advice should be the same as in the pre-COVID era and the same that will be in the post-COVID era. We need to have healthier uh, nutrition, healthier lifestyle, to have healthier child, children, sorry, and in the unhealthier adults. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moreno, and also thank you to Dr. Ascension Marcos for both uh, interesting speeches. And we have a lot of questions. Uh, it's quite late, but we will try to answer some of them. Uh, for example, one of the questions is related with immune boosters. Uh, what are the main immune boosters for babies? And what general nutrition advice would you give for a baby who may, may have contracted COVID-19? Baby. Well, I suppose they are asking about a baby of few months old that is well, only well, taking or even formula or breastfeeding. Well, I think you all of us agree that uh, um, breastfeeding a baby is the best way we can provide uh, uh, immune defense against any kind of infections. Although we have no data on, um, on COVID infection, uh, we could say probably the same. And in, mm -hmm. in the case that we cannot provide breastfeeding, we need to have an infant formula with the most um, similarity to human milk or having probiotics, prebiotics, some kind of um, lysozyme or osteopontin or all of these components that could play a role in defense against infection. And regarding boosters, is the, the only consideration we can say just now, I don't know if Ascension agrees, is having a healthier, a varied food pattern. The, the higher the number of foods you have in your plate, the healthier will be your, your eating pattern and, and the possibilities of being healthy. So this, besides having enough sun or staying outside, if you can, you have the chance to be outside because of the climate and weather allows, is, is, is my advice. Uh, Ascension, would you say something yeah, yeah. different? No, no, uh, I fully agree with, with you. The, the thing is that um, it's very important to take into account in not only food, for sure, it's, it's very important, but also the environment. So um, nowadays, uh, uh, if you live in an urban area, it's not so healthy because of uh, pollution. So for uh, babies and uh, just to avoid the uh, allergies, for example, it's very important to avoid uh, to, to live in, in those areas. But uh, it is something that uh, sometimes uh, you, you can't uh, cope with uh, these situations. So, but uh, obviously probiotics are very, very important. Another question is related with probiotics, and they ask if, uh, if in the infants that are being breastfed, uh, the addition of an extra dosage of probiotics can have a paper improving the immunity response or not. Well, uh, the, there are some. Yeah, there, there are some studies, especially those related to lactobacillus uh, GG and uh, the possibility to reduce the susceptibility to, to have a, any uh, dermatitis or any allergy. But um, uh, the, 
there are not so many studies. Uh, so some some probiotics, but uh, still we need uh, much more information and studies. I fully agree with with Ascension, and probably breast milk has already probiotics, and 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 I have and some some mothers who could improve the probiotic load of her milk probably taking them prio probiotics. So yes. there is also something we can do even in the mother. So probably attention you yes. in yeah, yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you are right. And uh, also uh, the intake of uh, omega-3 fatty fatty acids is uh, also very important, uh, not only in the baby, but also in the mother, especially those who are going to be, yeah. To feed the breast, to have breastfeeding. Yeah. And what do you think about uh, giving breastfeeding? Well, when we know that the mother uh, is having the COVID nineteen. Well, it, it, it is something that the, yeah, um, probably you you know more more than me because. Uh, there are very very few studies, no? Yeah, well, we know if the mother has uh, suffered the disease during pregnancy and she's now fine, I will for sure provide the baby with breastfeeding because some of the IgE secretory yeah. IgEs will provide some kind of of immune yeah. defense in the newborn. The, the the tough question is being infected in the time of delivery and. And this is how to how to balance the benefit of breastfeeding yeah. at the same time yeah. Yeah. avoiding the contact between the mother and the baby. So this is one question that should be answered by the the, the, yeah. the, the mother and the physicians. I'm balancing both, both yes. questions because as 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 Tension has said, there is so few studies that can give us a robust answer to, to this topic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, anyway, so sorry. Anyway, if you uh, consult the PubMed, it's amazing the how a uh, high amount of uh, studies regarding coronavirus. But if if you are looking for something in particular, you don't find it. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, true. this is, a, this is a, the question that that that, that Ascension has pointed is quite interesting because probably we have seen like a pandemia also of uh, information in the of uh, of studies. Some of them are not of high quality, so make us some confusion because you may uh, read one one thing and and, and the contrary in, in in the same day. So yeah. we we have to choose the the the, the, the right. The, the, the official positions of the of the health authorities or or, or guidelines for the from the societies in order to avoid this kind of 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 of, of noise. Yes, yeah, it's true, it's true. And we we all know the recommendations of the World Health Organization, but which is the if you must recommend a minimum minimum period for give breastfeeding for a baby which uh, which will be the length of this period well um well you, you are the pediatrician uh, i'm a scientist only but uh, for, for me between two and three months two and three months the least minimum yeah. much uh, better four or six uh, yeah, minimum. Agree. I agree with with Ascension. Yeah. And the minimum is, is always one day more. So so we say, well, you can give two two days, two two months, and one day is better than two months. So, but probably the four first months of life are quite important if, yes. if you can afford that. So that's yeah, the yeah. idea. Yeah. Yes. And do you think that uh, child Childhood immunization may boost the immune system, and that's why children have uh, less probability of being uh, contaminated with coronavirus than adults. 
This is a quite quite interesting. Yeah. Close reaction with um, some vaccines. Uh, some uh, are, well, are saying, uh, This is well, a quite interesting. Yes, yeah. Question. Yeah. Uh, at this moment, everything is blocked. So, so some people say, or some scientists say that the reason why children, infants, has and children have a uh, low severity of the disease, maybe because they suffer other common infections by virus. So they have kind of their own immune system activated, not to yes. this COVID-19, but also to other coronavirus, rhinovirus, yeah. enterovirus, and probably there is like a, an interaction between this immune um, boost that they have by being exposed to infections and, and the and, and the COVID-19, and this may also applies for the use of pro probiotics and breast milk as a source of probiotics because having the, this contact with with the the good things is also good for the immune system and the and the the, the good microbiota is, is one of the of the best best ways to 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 deal with this. Yeah. No, no, I, I fully agree, but uh, in addition, I think that uh, bifidobacteria are very important. So bifidobacteria are in a very high amount um, at uh, the early stage, but also in children and adolescents, but then in adults and uh, in elderly people, these bacteria are very low. So probably they have a very important role, and we don't know yet to what extent they can they can be involved in the infection of this virus and the consequences. Um, another thing is that and a concept that has been introduced during the speeches that is the hygienic theory of. Uh, development of the immune system until which level this hygienic theory can be the answer to the difference in in the number of people that can be uh, well that 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 have been uh, with uh, COVID-19 in the different countries of of the planet can be an explanation of this hygienic theory yes. the different development of the immune system between countries or geographical areas or not well for sure the immune system is different around the world so depending on uh, many factors so depending on our lifestyles so i already said that it's not only the diet is uh, our food behavior how many times we eat and uh, the amounts we eat and uh, also the physical activity the the, the stress and uh, the environment so there are so many relevant factors to take into account that it is not so easy that's why when um, uh, jose manuel dr moreno said that um, well, uh, it's not easy to know uh, the role of a, just a nutrient on the immune system. Is because of because there are so many factors involved that is impossible to know what can happen in humans. It's very easy to know what can happen in animal models, but not in humans. So. Well, um, I thought that the infections were lower nowadays, but this uh, virus is uh, changing our minds in a way. And which is your opinion about giving uh, supplements of vitamins and minerals to children in this situation? Do you think improves the defense of the body? 
uh, which ones do you, do you think that are the better ones and for how long is recommended to supplement children with them? For, for taking the data we have now, we cannot say for sure that there is a need for supplement to for supplementation of any kind of vitamins or combination of vitamins of or minerals. This this is like the official um, recommendation. Although there are some uh, some, some studies that really mainly with vitamin with vitamin D that better levels of vitamin D improves the immune function, and this also means having some defense against infections. And mainly, if this happens during the winter time in in and in in, yeah. in the young in, in the infants and young children, so and also the adolescents are the other group of people with lower levels. So uh, I, we cannot suggest as 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 a society, as a scientific society, well provide 400 or 1,000 units of vitamin D every day in order to avoid infections. Although yeah. uh, there is as I have said, and, and, and I would like to know the, the opinion of attention, if this can be said. And for instance, for other infections, not for COVID-19, we, we know for sure, for instance, that zinc is quite important in those countries with a high prevalence of diarrhea. So oral rehydration solutions with zinc have a role in this, but because zinc has also the, 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 its role in, in immune function, but in when you have a specific condition as, as this COVID-19, difficult to not to say, difficult to say. No, no, we we don't know yet. No, for example, in, in under nutrition, for sure, zinc is very important, and also iron, vitamin C, and D. But uh, for example, for um, uh, adults and the elderly. It is more important to um, the supplements of uh, vitamin C and uh, vitamin D too. So it depends on the age. But the, the problem nowadays is that uh, regarding COVID-19, we don't have uh, enough uh, information about that. But let, let me. Uh, you need to share to to to. to be sure that they receive at least than the minimal amount. So, for instance, we know that and this is the recommendation in, in, in Spain and also in the American Academy of Pediatrics. So, all infants under one year old, they will they, they need to receive at least 400 units of vitamin D in order to be sure that they receive the minimal amount independently yeah. of the status in the mother. So, yeah. we, 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 at least we, did, we need to, to see give them at least the, the, the minimal recommendation. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have been speaking about probiotics and the question is, uh, are, are is yogurt included in this source of probiotics? <laughs> Can we consider that supplementing the children diet with yogurt, we, they will have these benefits that we are speaking about? Well, uh, we, we have uh, carried out some uh, studies on, on yogurt and uh, not only on healthy children, but also on um, patients with uh, anorexia nervosa. And uh, for sure, the immune system is um, um, enhanced, uh, enhances uh, after the intake of yogurt but uh, during six uh, weeks so it depends only also not only the 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 dose but also the the time when when you 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 are eating the the yogurt however in in in, in small children uh, i don't have any data about that Dr. Moreno? Well, uh, uh, no, as, as, as Pension has said, fermented dairy are part of our culture, at least in, 
Asia and in Europe, and this is uh, this part of the, the the ideal eating pattern. So we 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 need to, to to say that young people and old people need to receive yogurt and all other uh, fermented uh, uh, daily products. Uh, yes. But in the infancy, it's not so easy to give the same recommendation because it's uh, these are they, they need to be provided within with milk with regular milk and you have other more adapted uh, feeding for infancy uh, and we then we can provide the probiotics present or the biotics present in the yogurt not in a in in, in normal milk at an infant formula or breast milk has also the the yeah. the idea but at the end of the infancy at the uh, for one year on year one year and beyond sure that they, they it is a good idea to to, to have your good in the diet yep we finish with two questions one is related with omega-3 uh do you think that depending on the diet of the children it can be interesting to supplement them with omega-3 and with uh, at which age we can begin to give uh, our child uh, with this kind of supplementation well i think that uh, the supplementation can uh, uh, can be included uh, since uh, six months omega-3 yes yeah well, yeah. uh, I think uh, human there beings have some studies on that, and we have one. Yes. Yeah. Omega three is included in the in the whole life in the in the, in the human in the human being. Breast milk has mm -hmm. uh, omega three. You can right. improve the omega three status of the breast milk, providing fish for instance not fish to the mother so mm -hmm. there is way even to improve the the load or the intake of omega-3 even below uh, six months and also as you know at this in europe the legislation now uh, is, is mandatory to have dha in all infant formula infant and follow-up formula because it is considered that is a need to have the the, the uh, omega-3 and also, yes. as, as Tension has pointed out, if we are thinking in complementary feeding, we should think in way, which are the, 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 the sources of omega-3 in the diet to include them early in, in this complementary feeding in infancy, and then following the rest of uh, children and adults uh, yeah, and yeah, down. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. But it's clearly anti-inflammatory, clearly well, as there is a lot of things to, to say about omega-3. Yeah. And another question is related with human milk because we have been speaking about the benefits of for the babies of taking and human milk and what about adults? Can be an extract of human milk improve the immune response of adults also? Or do you know any study about this? Well, uh, what uh, we know is that um, uh, milk has a particular uh, uh, fatty acids, saturated fatty acids, and um, they are important because they facilitate the absorption of uh, micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, especially calcium, and also vitamin D. So it's also very important for humans, for adults. But, uh, not, breast milk. Yeah. No. but not breast milk. There's milk for the baby. I mean, the adults should have omega-3 through other sources. So, I mean, some people think that if an adult receives breast milk, he's going to be younger, uh, healthier, uh, smart, uh, um, Hands on and so on, and give them to the right one. You can look for other things. I, I mean, this is my my consideration. I think we all three 
I give you that idea. Please provide <laughs> breast milk to the babies. And do the most. <laughs> but, you, uh, sorry, sorry. So you, you are you are saying breast milk for adults? Yeah. Ah, adults. No, no, no. No, forget it. <laughs> No, no, no. It's important for for babies, and it's uh, the role of breastfeeding babies. No more. <laughs> well, we have made a very deeply discussion, uh, <laughs> reviewing a lot of the questions that we have received. I want to thank you uh, again for your interesting and complete speeches and I want to thank everybody that has been with us during today uh, during these hours and I want to uh, also inform you that during the month of June we are going to have two more webinars one about early programming and the other about chrono nutrition and after a few days we will inform you about the hour and the date thank you very much to everybody Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, Alicia. Bye. 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 Bye